Um, Boink. Penguin, Kaisen, Penguin Kaisen 2015. Berkeley Open Infrastructure for Networking Computing, which is what the study at Home Software has morphed into, is now used for many, many more programs. So you can download this one thing on your computer instead of study at home. And in addition to hunting for aliens, you can also do math problems or have your computer solve astrophysics problems. I think there's an asteroid hunting thing that operates on your computer. There's a cementular biology volume. So no matter what your science that you're interested in, and being here, I assume you like some kind of thing, you can contribute with this blank software. Yeah. This is one of those. The aliens might have the answers to all those problems. They could, yes. However, I think what was so 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 is the does the radio stuff for study. His prediction is that they'll find the signal in like 2025 to 2040. So, and we keep looking, we might find it, statistically, or never, well, maybe, yeah. It's still fun to look, and we're still doing a lot of great times when we're doing it. Okay, so this is one of those horrible slides that's just, look at all this stuff. I did not want to have to go find the logos for each of these things, so instead I just did the cheap way out. Here's all the different things you can do with the Boink software, which is what SETI at Home has morphed into. We have a, a lot of astronomy things. Again, I'm just trying to guys. But we also have some math problems solving, some computer science problems. There's even uh, some uh, statistical modeling, all kinds of stuff. And most of these are just passive, but they're starting to move into the interactive stuff. So now instead of just donating your computer, you can help with your time. So. One of the first things that did this model, instead of just let me use your computer, but also now, hey, let me use your brain, is with, oh, this is a photo picture, I'm sorry. So this is a Hubble Deep Field image. There's also the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And they have thousands of pictures, millions of pictures. Each dot in this picture is actually a galaxy. So many galaxies. So you want to classify them. It's the first step in understanding anything in science, is just figure out what you have. And to look at every single picture would have taken years, years. So they had, their estimations was it would take them like 10 to 15 years just to process all the data. So they wrote this computer thing, opened up the website, got people to sign up. And within the first 24 hours, they had 70,000 classifications an hour, which is significantly more than a couple of postdocs could do in a year. So, so they were pretty happy with that. Much cheaper than a postdoc, too. Um, now, the big difference between this and study at home is this is data analysis. So you can't just trust the computer to do exactly what you're going to tell it. There is the human factor. And, and humans are notoriously a little inconsistent, is the nicest way to say this. So they actually make you go through training before you can start. And here is where I hope the internet works. Although it's a con day, so probably not gonna happen. Oh, I think it's working. So instead of just starting, they start you off with a training picture, and this one's pretty much just a boring blob. So you just pick which one you think it's closest to. I'm gonna go with boring blob. What do you guys think? Cigar shaped, in between, or round? We have a consensus. No way. <laughs> is there anything odd? This is kind of just a boring blob. Is that the flying saucer button? or the stray artifacts. Actually, this is one of the places where the new science does come. So you go through these data, and normally it's boring stuff, boring stuff, boring stuff. But it is important to have this option of other, because who knows what might be in there. I know when I was undergrad studying Mars ridges, if anybody was here last year, that was my other talk. I had lots of pictures of Mars daily. Just how does the dust look on Mars? And one day I saw a cloud that looked like a hurricane. So I, I sent that over to somebody who studied the atmosphere, and they were like, oh my gosh, that's so cool. So it, it is useful to have this button of like, hey, 
Somebody else might think this is cool. It doesn't fit into this category, but it's definitely weird. And it's amazing how good our eyes are at just instantly recognizing that's not normal. That's cool. What do you guys think of this one? Of course, when I'm doing the show, I'm not going to get an interesting one, right? Boring, smooth? Boring, smooth. But this one's less, that's definitely more in between, right? Mm -hmm. One good one, and then maybe I'll... Oh, at the beginning of the training, there's also a note. If you notice in that last picture, it had one in the middle and then a couple on the sides. They, they actually want you to always do the middle one. Even if it's not the most interesting, it's the middle of the photo that you're supposed to study. Okay. I'm excited this work. There's a couple other ones. Yeah, internet. So, so what were you trying to do there? You, uh, by, by giving your input, what, what was the goal? This is the training. So this isn't just, hey, give me your input. This is to make sure you have to classify a couple before you're actually allowed to start with the raw data. Okay. A another protection is because people are inconsistent. With having this many people help out, you can actually give the same thing to four or five people and make sure they have consistent results. And if those four or five people don't agree, give it to even more people. And that's the, th those are the ones that go to more and more people. But what's the goal of this project? That, this particular Galaxy Zoo? Do I have my other slide for this? Galaxy Zoo, they want to classify the galaxy. Oh, it went back to the same spot. And they've started to break them down. You get, I don't have that slide. Um, so instead of just, right now, I'm showing you all blurry blobby ones because these are the ones people disagree on, so these are the ones that show up the most. But when you do get into the interesting ones that have a disc or a feature or a ring, you get the handlebar ones, there's lots of different, let me see if I can find that one quickly. If I can't do it in less than 30 seconds, I'll speak it. That is presenter rabbit hole. <laughs> So, Hubble classification scheme. I found it three seconds. Yeah. Long website. Too many computers. So, here is the classification scheme. It starts with the boring blobs, and you start to get into these more the, the shapes we associate with the Milky Way and bar galaxies, and spiral galaxies, and they're starting to classify them, and they're starting to learn, are these just different stages of the same object, and we're seeing them throughout history as they evolve, or are these different types of objects, and they're the end result of different types of evolution. So we're getting these differences, and while they're trying to program computers to tell the difference between this picture and this picture, the computers really stink at that. Our eyes are much better so far. They're getting a little better, but it's still, we're much better at going, oh, that's a spiral, that's a stick, that's a blob, that's less blobby. <laughs> like, we're actually pretty good at putting gradients on the blobs, when the computer's more like, I don't see it, sorry. So this but is why people are necessary for this. Could be the result of uh, two galaxies colliding, too, right? Some of them uh, are, actually. Oh, this one is too colliding. But they have started to notice in the different pictures that they can start to guess the distance to the object based on some of the classifications. All because of people. Okay, so. Besides having people go through and do stuff, they're actually publishing results. There are about 60 papers, scientific peer-reviewed papers, that list plus 60,000 Galaxy Zoo users as part of the publication list. So you won't actually get your name on the paper, but if you help out, you will be acknowledged in the mass of other volunteers. This was so popular, they branched out from galaxy classification to a, another bane of my existence when I was an undergraduate researcher, crater counting. So here's moon pictures. And you click on the craters, 
and say, is it a simple crater, a bowl-shaped crater? Does it have an injecta? Are there some interesting features? And you can tag all these things on a picture. You have to go through similar training to the Galaxy Zoo. It's a little more in-depth, and they show you various things. But once you get trained, you can start helping contribute to science. And crater counting is how we do geologic history on other planets. So when we do different geologic regions for Mars or the Moon or Mercury, it's primarily based on crater data. So before this kind of crowdsourcing, they would get undergraduates to help them and spend hours at minimum wage doing these exact same measurements. I spent a year and a half doing these kind of measurements. And now we get you guys to do it as a video game. Uh, a more simple one, and I sat at this game for half an hour last night, and apparently only the boring pictures are left. This was launched before they launched the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, and some other, they're trying to find good landing spots, and you don't want to land where there's boulders. That's bad for the spacecraft. So this is just supposed to be, which one has more boulders? And for a half an hour straight, I just picked no boulders. So this one is a little bit past its time to have gotten to all the boring pictures. But it's, it's, it, this is easier, this doesn't involve training. So the advantages of this type of classification is it's just compare these two pictures, which one has more? So there's less training needed, there's less wiggle room for error. So they did Galaxy Zoo and Moon Zoo. Both of these things are very successful. It's now grown into the universe. You can classify galaxies, classify moon, classify sunspots and solar flares, uh, help them find exoplanet data, identify the, the weird soup of the data and find the exoplanet. They've really branched out. And all of this is more interactive. So we've taken just having your computer analyze data and now we've gone to you guys are helping actually analyze the data. And now, our other way of helping out, third way, actually get outside and make observations. If you have a lot of money and a lot of free time, you can become an amateur astronomer. Uh, the Rosetta mission has actually recruited, you have your equipment, go outside, take pictures of the comet. The more data we get, even if it's not from the highest quality telescopes, you don't need the biggest telescopes to get quality data. You just need a lot of it. So if we get a lot of people taking a lot of pictures, we can get much more accurate information on Rosetta missions. This is a very specific version. They've now sort of branched out, and there's a whole network of the Association of Lunar and Planetary Observers. This is mostly limited to things in our solar system. And you can do anything from observing comets, um, observing asteroids, and these asteroids, even with small telescopes. Small telescopes have the advantage of having a lot of free time. So you can just point at the same object for a long period of time and see small variations in its brightness, get its rotational patterns, figure out how it moves. These are the kinds of things that help us discover asteroid moons, that help us figure out if it's a fast rotator or a slow rotator. And these move into orbital things, which will be a talk that I'm giving later that's much more science oriented. But if you don't have expensive equipment, and most of us don't, and most of us don't have that kind of free time, there's also the random cell phone app option. So this is just a quick search in the Android Play Store for citizen science. And you have anything from mapping field ecology, mapping stars, and there's one that's a video game that I can't see right now. I'm going to talk about it. One of my favorites, because I was actively involved in this, Globe at Night. You don't need any fancy equipment. You just go outside and you compare how the night sky looks to you, to other people. And the goal of this is to map light pollution. So it's kind of a grown problem. If you go outside tonight, we are in a big city. You probably can't see most of the stars in the sky. So what this does, and here's another link that I hope works. What I did is I have all these links, and if they don't work, I have the backup picture.
But the internet's working. Yay. I can't read backwards. So if you're in a downtown area with a lot of brightness, you might see Sirius, which is the brightest star in Jupiter, and maybe one or two other stars. If you're in the middle of the country, you'll see so many things, you won't even be able to tell what's what. And you go through these different maps, and you figure out, what, what can you see? And you just tell them, and they map it, and they get a global database of these to help map light pollution and how we're losing it. They collect a lot of them, they map this. Uh, the 2014 results, they had 18,000 observations. So this goes beyond just taking a picture and analyzing. You actually go outside and collect data. And here's a map of the stuff locally, and you can see where there's good lighting conditions and bad lighting conditions. Michigan here has some of the worst, especially this area. We are a giant, light polluted area. Now, if you're not an astronomer, or you don't like nighttime, and you prefer to go out with nature and interact with people, there are now community driven networks that do similar things, but instead of just going out by yourself with your cell phone app, um, there's a network of like park rangers and college students who study ecology, you give them some lists of like, I want to study this snake. And you give them like a 10, 20 minute training and you go out and you find signs that that snake is there. Or you can, the trees in my area look like this compared to the trees in that area, how are they growing? And mapping all kinds of stuff. Now, I'm not an ecologist, so if I went into detail on this, I would be lying. Let's just get that. Okay, now, this last version, one of my favorites, is how we take ga uh, the, this data and we gamify it so people are playing video games while analyzing data. One of the first ones I found is called Play to Cure, Genes in Space. This is a cell phone app where you fly your spaceship through a fictional field of element alpha and you go to collect it. And how this actually turns into science this is a micro DNA array. So if anybody's a biologist, this is how they study your DNA. This is actually a long series, and they're trying to fit it on a piece of paper, so they do it like this. Another way to visualize this is with a graph like this. And what they really care about are the weird guys that are up, have an increased density. So what they do is they have you in the game. This is your interface. Doesn't this look much more interesting than this boring science data <laughs> that grad students would stare at all day? I'm used to this, so I'm okay with this, but most people are like, data, I hate math. So instead, let's have them doing the math, but they don't think it's math. So here is your, your galactic route for your spacecraft, and you gotta map your way through this element alpha, and your goal is to maximize how much you collect. You want the most fuel to make your spaceship go better. The more you get, you get to upgrade your spaceship, you get better wings, change colors, better, um, for some of you who like space, my spacecraft terminology is deleting my brain right now. So after you put these green dots on the map to figure out where things change, you then get to fly through this with your spaceship. The green circles are your guidelines. 
But they've also seen that the act of flying itself, you get better, while trying to maximize your score, if you see it this way, you actually change course more often, you get a more accurate. So this is like the first level rough outline for the data, and then you fly through it and they get better data. And then they take lots of people who play the same data, and whoever has the highest score, that's the most efficient route. That's what they then use to try to attack these cancer cells with these patterns instead of trying to just have the computer solve it. And the video gamers are doing better than the computer programs at trying to find the most effective path mm -hmm. through these things. Is that a question? Yeah, so I, I don't understand. What is, how does the path to cure cancer? So this is this array of data. And the abnormal cells, in this particular case, the, these are probably repeated copies of the same DNA pattern. So that's an abnormal cell doing things it shouldn't do. And this helps them find those cells. So they, now, now they can tell where in that pattern that is. And they can then attack that more effectively than just giving you treatment for everything. They can only treat what is wrong with just you. So this is helping to cater treatments to individual patients. So the data you're looking at is one person's, their data for their cancer. And this helps them understand that individualized treatment. And then they also, to make it more fun, you can earn, um, if you collect really well, you get the high score, you get bonus fields because you go shoot at asteroids. As an asteroid scientist, former asteroid scientist, the fields never look like this. But that's a different talk. It's still fun to shoot at them. Um, another really successful version of this is called Fold It. This one's a little more complicated. I don't think they have a cell phone version. You have to download this one onto your computer. And this, again, um, comes to diseases and protein folding. So this is a protein molecule. In this case, it's a DNA hydrogen bond that this is playing to. And this object folds along all these different paths, and when it reproduces, it's folded one way, and it unfolds, it's different. And how these things fold helps determine which enzymes they can interact with later. But to get all these different things to do these different things, and we can't see it happening because they're so small and it happens so quickly. So instead, they try to model, how can this fold? What's the most effective way? The computers really suck at it. They get people doing this, and there was a problem that was bugging people for like 15 years, and the video gamers did it in three weeks. These scientists have been studying this for 15 years. They gamified it, put it out on the internet, let people just click through it, and they solved it in three weeks. So this is a, an AIDS protein to the code, and we can figure out which enzymes will interact with this molecule now and help to, to cure these diseases. Folded has been one of the most successful and has been one of the most popular, but it's also one of the most involved. To play this game, do people get pretty, pretty hardcore? This has a following almost as like hardcore as like World of Warcraft or other guys. This is much more in the line of replacing bejeweled blitz while you wait in line at the store. You play for a couple of minutes and then you can be done. While well, the Folded is like, I gotta solve it. I can do it. Well, can you describe what a, a gamer would do with that uh, that picture there? What, how do they interact with it? What do they do? So there's lots of different ways to interact with it. I haven't played too much. This one, again, a strong advice. But this one, um, it has to do with how these moves and how they interact and the chemical interactions. So each different joint has different things it can and can't do. And how they've gamified it is they've determined points based on how efficiently it, it folds, and the different arrangements, and if you can get it smaller or all those details, you get more points. And again, they have lots of people do the same thing, and the highest score is what the scientists then look at to see, is this a real world model, or did they just find some weird fluke of our program? And they actually do have scientists then. So this isn't necessarily giving scientists the answer, this is giving scientists more probable answers that they can then go look at and analyze. Okay. So you can help and become a scientist. You don't have to be an expert to be a scientist. You can download simple apps. 
Just don't get too carried away. There's this one guy hijacked all the computers at the school he worked for. He was like the, the, the lead at Study at Home, analyzed more than anybody, because he was using the entire school district's worth of computers. Harmony, like, they actually like, determined that the students weren't getting the computer time they needed because the computers were all dedicated to study. That guy got in trouble. You know, I've wondered about the electricity use, too. When, when I was running it, uh, my computer was running full bore, and I thought maybe that was probably using a lot of electricity. Is there any study of on that? Uh, if you want to know about that, go look at people who figure out the cost benefit of mining bitcoins. Uh, yeah. Because that's a, that is a big enough concern now that it's no longer profitable to mine bitcoins on your own computer. You have to get specialized hardware. Oh, okay. Cost benefit of what? Mining bitcoins, the uh, cryptocurrency, and the, the main cost there is electricity. Okay, so I was worried I'd have way too much, so I cut out like a bunch of things that I wanted to go over, <laughs> and now I'm under time. But this is okay. I love answering questions. So, Ooh, question. Question. Please. So, uh, several times you said, but computers suck at that, which is true. But I think that's only because they don't have enough training data to work on. So is some of the intent behind like the zoo programs to get enough, but like tagging people in Facebook, yeah, four years ago Facebook was like picking out random things and saying, is this your spouse? Look at this can of soda, And it's now your best friend. it's really terrifyingly good. Yes. Because it's, it has a big enough yes. body. So is, is the intent behind some of these to oh, build up enough yeah. to get computers? A lot of this is for that. The, the downside is with research, like, you know, our faces, that's going to be the same data for a very long time. Most of the time with research, it's here's a large collection of something no one's looked at before. So it's harder to train the computer. Right. Like, we're, we're not even quite sure yet what it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. So it's like, so a, a lot of these new ones, it's not just, is it this or is it this? Now they've moved on to, here's a picture, what's cool with it? And you actually get to determine and help. Uh, some of these systems science programs have actually gotten to the level where the people who play the game or who are involved have now started coming up with the classification schemes themselves. Hmm. And it just sort of naturally falls that you get enough people together, they start to see patterns, they start to, in the forums, decide, hey, this is cool, let's get this branch, let's get that branch. And they're now starting to guide the scientists, which is really cool. Hmm. The next little bit like campaign, I think, is actually, what is this, May? May 19th to 18th, they always do it in the two week period closest to when there's not going to be a moon, because we don't want the moon interfering with it. I highly recommend getting outside, filling out one of these. I'm going to go under time. How many speakers go back on under that? <laughs> okay. I'm recording it. Is that rainbow? Maybe you can demo one of them. Like, oh, yeah. uh, how about that? That protein folding thing? That's a, I haven't done that one yet. Oh, another cool thing is just get on your phone and download some of these. And play these instead of... I can't even think of the bad games right now. Those are like... Angry Birds. Angry, thank you. Angry Birds are like... Um, the Jeweled Blitz. That's, the, that's like three years old. I'm out of it. Fold It is one I've seen a lot of really awesome stuff for. And the biologists are always convincing me it's good. But again, I'm biased. And I want to do all the astronomy related ones. Showing my Google history to a group full of people. <laughs>
problem and solving problems. I have a podcast. Okay. Saw down there uh, about their podcast. Okay. Scroll down. Somewhere in the depth. Uh, one of the headers.